Hey friends, Elizabeth here from Plant Based Bride, back again with Plantmas Day 11. And in today's Plantmas video, I just wanted to go through my final reading stats for 2020, talk through them, chat about how I feel I did as far as my initial goals at the start of the year and new goals that I kind of picked up throughout the year, and how that translates to what I'm hoping to do with my reading next year and where I kind of hope these stats to be next year as well. So this one is going out to all of my fellow data nerds out there, all of you who love a good graph, a good pie chart. I feel ya. That's me. <laughs> so I will say that this is a little less extensive than I would like it to be, just because I didn't even think to start recording this data until very close to the end of this year when I started including stats in my videos, which I think might have been maybe in October was when I first started doing it. So I only started tracking that data back in October, which means that in the last couple days, I had to go all the way back to January and go through every single book I read this year and write down that information. And it took me forever. So I tried to keep the categories to a smaller number than I would have liked, just so that I could manage it and make it happen at all. So this is, you know, sometimes perfect is the enemy of the good. And I wanted this video to happen. So I just made it happen. <laughs> and now we're here. It's wonderful. So that being said, if there is data that I do not have in this video that you think would be beneficial for me to track, or you just think is interesting or something that you track in your reading, please let me know in the comments down below, because I would love to have an extensive list before 2021 starts so that I can set up a spreadsheet. And as I go through the year, I can write all that down as I go along so that it feels like barely any effort, just a couple quick minutes after I finish a book tacked on to, you know, writing a review and giving a rating instead of a couple days of painstakingly going through 100 plus books and writing all this down. So let me know in the comments. I would love to know if you leave a comment recommending to me a data point that I should consider for next year. That will be your entry for today's giveaway. As always, I will be doing a giveaway in today's Plantmas video. Check out the description box for all the details how to enter. I will talk about it more at the end of the video, but I just wanted to let you know that that comment could also be your entry. So you can think about that through the video, see what stats I do include, and see if there's something that I'm missing that you could use to enter to win. Okay, let's jump into it. <laughs> Disclaimer, it is currently 11 o'clock at night and I've been filming another video all day. So hopefully my brain functions normally. We shall see. Okay. Also, I hope you enjoy the visual component of this video. I worked hard on these graphs. I think they're pretty. So yeah. Okay. So I wanted to start with the basic numbers. So the first thing that I feel like always comes up is how many books did you read? I will say as I'm filming this, there's about a week and a half left in the year. And I am taking a full week off of all work once Plantmas is done, once I have shipped out all giveaway prizes, once I have finished up all my shop orders and got them out the door, I'm going to take a week off, hopefully also from just social media in general, but we'll see how I do. So in that time, Time, my plan is to read a whole heck of a lot. I have finished 117 books as of recording this, but I have about six books on the go that I can definitely finish in the next week. And another couple that are waiting that I haven't started yet. A couple of those are actually quite short and some of them I've made a lot of progress already. So anyway, long story short, I'm going to finish a bunch more books before the end of the year. And I have figured out which ones I'm going to focus on and which ones I'm going to read. And I feel like at this point, I know my reading pace pretty well. And I also will have very few distractions for reading for the next week. So even though I have technically only finished 117 books as a filminess, I did include the last eight books that I know I'm going to finish before the end of the year into these stats, other than some of them like the rating, since I obviously don't know what I'm going to rate them yet, because I wanted this to be more complete. So that disclaimer in there, I think that's it for disclaimers, we can actually start. So total number of books read in 2020 is 125. And I feel pretty great about that. My initial goal was 90, which I upped to 100 after I think just a month or two because I realized I could probably make that happen and it was just a much nicer number. And then I think I passed 100 back in October and realized that I could probably get to 125. And that's kind of been my unofficial goal ever since. So 125 books, I'm really happy about that. As I mentioned at the start of the year, I came from reading 
maybe five books a year, if that. For the last couple years, I really dropped off reading. I was a voracious reader as a child. I read so much through my childhood, through my teen years. And then when I went to college, I had zero time to read anything that wasn't for school. So it was just all textbooks and plays and more textbooks and more plays and that's it. <laughs> because that's what theater school is like. And then I graduated and I was working like three simultaneous jobs while auditioning for musicals and performing in musicals and then working on cruise ships and, you know, doing professional theater contracts where I was doing two to three shows a day, plus rehearsals, plus trying to just live a normal life. I felt that lack, that gaping hole in my soul keenly. And that's why I started this challenge this year. That's why I wanted to document my process of reading more again. And I feel like I fell into it so naturally and I was so happy about it. And it just has fed my soul in a way that I didn't even realize I was missing for a number of years because I just let life get the best of me and, you know, kind of pull me along behind it instead of taking the reins and making my own decisions about how I want to spend my time and what kind of entertainment I want to consume, what media I want to consume, um, what my priorities are. So anyway, all that to say, I'm just really, really happy about this number. I feel really proud of myself and I also just feel so grateful to have been able to consume so many incredible stories because I really have read so many incredible stories this year, discovered so many incredible authors this year. It is ridiculous. So anyway, I promise I'm not going to talk that long about every point. That was just, that was a big one. Anyway, <laughs> as I said, it's 11 o'clock at night. Here we are. Okay. So the next thing was pages read. Goodreads told me that I read over 38,000 pages which is staggering. Average book length was 328 pages, which I feel is a pretty good length. So the shortest book was The Importance of Being Earnest, which is not surprising. It's actually a play and plays tend to have shorter page counts since they have to be performed aloud for an audience and most audiences don't want to sit around for 10 hours. I mean, if it was The Importance of Being Earnest in a 10 hour play version, I would be up for it, but I don't know how many people who are not theater nerds, trained actors <laughs> who love the craft, who would be into that, you know? Anyway, and the longest book that I read was Plain Bad Heroines, which was 619 pages, which is quite long. I, I, I will say quite long. I'm surprised that there weren't any longer books, but I guess I just didn't pick up any longer books than that this year. It is what it is. So the next stats I want to look at are age demographics. So this is the demographic that the books are aimed towards. So typically, to my understanding, there are three main categories, which are middle grade, YA, and adult. And I read, unsurprisingly, a vast majority of adult novels. So 76% adult, 23.2% young adult, and then 0.8% middle grade, because I read one middle grade book this year which was Over the Woodward Wall, which is sort of a companion novel to an adult book that I read this year, Middle Game, so that's why I read it. I don't typically read middle grade. I don't really have a reason to. I'm not working with children. I don't have children in my life, so that makes sense. And then for YA, I occasionally will pick up YA just for my own enjoyment, or, you know, sometimes I'm sent arcs that are YA. I feel like I've definitely gotten to the point in my life where I am old enough that I really feel the YA-ness of YA books. Like they, the characters just feel so young. Actually, this makes me think of a book that I just recently finished, which was Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything, which is a YA, which I really enjoyed, but the characters felt quite young and there's some sort of, there's a bit of a romance subplot and there's some description of them kissing, making out and kind of doing other things. And um, I'm not gonna lie, it made me very uncomfortable <laughs> to, I was listening to the audiobook to listen to because I am a 28 year old woman. So listening to teenagers who sound quite young, having sexual experiences makes me very uncomfortable. I just don't want to hear about it. And you know, I'm all for sex positive representation of books for teens and preteens. They need that a hundred percent. Um, but it's not really something that I want to read. It just makes me uncomfortable. So yeah, if I were their age, it would be totally fine. But it's just, you know, looking at it as someone who's more than a decade older than these characters, it's just a bit weird, you know? So anyway, that's a side note. <laughs> but yeah, obviously for the most part, I read adult 
which is not surprising because I am in fact an adult. Okay, so next up, I wanted to track a couple more little basic stats. So the most popular book that I read, as in the book that has been read and rated the most times on Goodreads, was The Great Gatsby. Obviously, a lot of people read this in school. I didn't read it in school, but I did try to read it, I think, when I was a teenager, and I gave up on it very early. So technically, it was also a reread if you count reading a book that you DNF'd a reread, but it's also obviously an incredibly popular book. And then the least popular book I read this year was The House of Sticks by Derek Kungskin, which is a sci-fi novel, which was freaking incredible. I raved about it in my review. I gave it five stars. It was actually an arc that was sent to me by the publisher to read in ebook format, and I adored it. And I'm so sad to see that it is the least reviewed book that it has been the least read. It just hasn't had a lot of hype, I guess. It seems like it hasn't really been promoted much, which I, I honestly don't understand how the whole publishing world works, so I don't know. But it makes me really sad because this book was so freaking good, especially for sci-fi lovers and hard sci-fi who love the science of it. This takes place in the atmosphere above Venus, and the atmosphere above Venus is incredibly, well, and Venus itself, the surface is incredibly inhospitable to humans. There is acid rain and intense storms, essentially, through the levels of the atmosphere and lots of high pressure and heat. And it's basically a story of survival of this family surviving in the atmosphere above Venus and trying to make their life work. And they make this incredible discovery on the surface of the planet. And it's mind blowing. It's so, so, so good. And I believe that there's going to be a follow-up. I think there is. I read this months and months ago, so I can't remember now. I'm pretty sure there is, and gosh, I hope there is, because I want to read more in this universe and these characters. So if you love sci-fi and you haven't read The House of Sticks, please, please read it. It is so good. I'll link it down below. Anyway, so <laughs> the next stat I wanted to look at was how many arcs I was sent that I read. None of them were sent to me physically. They were either given to me as an ebook version or as an audiobook version to listen to, and ARCs or ALCs are just advanced copies of books that you can read or listen to before publishing um, that are sent to you either by a third party or by the publisher or by the author sometimes. So yeah, I got 17 ARCs this year, which is pretty great considering this is the first year that I was getting back into reading, and it was also the first time that I ever tried to get an ARC, <laughs> so very cool. I'm super appreciative of publishing houses and authors and third party sites that kind of help bridge that gap for making that happen because there are some incredible books that I read, like The House of Sticks, that I don't think I ever would have heard of or considered reading if I wasn't given an arc that I have absolutely adored. Ray Bearer was another one. I got the audio version of that through Neck Alley, and that was one of my favorite books of the year. Actually, I have it right here. So I was given the audio book version to listen to, and I adored this so much so, so, so much that I actually asked for the special gift box of this book from Indigo Chapters, um, which is a bookstore in Canada. I don't know if it's just Canada or if other countries have it, but anyway, it's a bookstore and they had this gift box that had the hardcover version, which has been signed by the author, which is very special. Own Your Story, Jay Ifweko, the author is Jordan Ifweko, and it also it's in gold glittery marker, which I mean, Clearly, we're meant to be best friends. So if you're watching this, Jordan Fueco, hit me up. Let's be best buddies. Anyway, um, so I really wanted to have a physical version so that when I reread this, which I definitely am going to, I can read it in physical form because I like to be able to consume books in multiple mediums. And my most favorite way to consume books is physical books, but um, it's not always practical, especially in a year with a pandemic where you can't go to the library and take out physical books. So I've been listening to way more audiobooks this year than anything else, but there's just something special about reading a physical book. So I'm really excited to experience that with this. And it is absolutely stunning. Actually, I'll just show you what the cover looks like under the dust jacket because it's so pretty. It is purple and it has the gold on the front and on the spine. So, so pretty. And the red end papers. Love it. And this is Terry Sai. 
Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, but yes, if I hadn't been giving this as an arc, I mean, I probably would have still read it because it was still pretty hyped up by a lot of booktubers I like to watch, but it's still really special because it's one of my favorites of the year. And House of Sticks is another one that's in there. Actually, I should buy a physical version of House of Sticks as well to support the author and also so I can reread it physically. I did have an ebook, so it's kind of similar. I did already read it with my eyes, but I just hate ebooks with a burning passion. So I feel like I would enjoy it more in physical book, which is saying a lot because I really enjoyed it in ebook form. Anyway, getting sidetracked again. This is why I shouldn't film videos at 11, now 11.30 at night. Okay, the next stat was how many books I did not finish, DNF'd, and that was four this year, which honestly is not bad considering I read 125 books. If I only DNF'd four, that's a pretty small percentage. But yeah, there were a couple books that I started and just, I just knew. All but one, I gave them a really good chance. I think for all but one, I tried to read at least 50% before making that decision. One of them, I think I got into the second chapter and just the style of it was really not working for me. So I put it aside. I may go back to it at some point. Yeah, and for DNFs, I don't review them. Sometimes I'll write a little note about why I DNF'd it just to let people know, but I don't rate or do an official review because I don't have the full context for the book. So it feels unfair to me anyway. Uh, and then the last stat I wanted to look at here was how many books I reread, and I didn't reread many this year. I reread two books, which were The Great Gatsby is one that I counted as rereading, uh, even though I didn't finish it the first time. And then Pope Joan was the other one, which is a book that I read and really liked as a teenager and reread and still really liked and gave it five stars. Okay, next step, we have the author's gender. So this is something that I didn't really think about at the start of the year, but throughout the year, as I was continuing to try to widen my horizons and read different things, I started to take note of how many books I was reading that were by different types of people. One of the things that I looked at was the gender of the author. So are they female, male, or are they non-binary or genderqueer? So my main goal here is just to read more books written by women and non-binary and genderqueer authors, gender fluid authors. I think we all know that men have the corner on the market when it comes to publishing, not only in numbers, but also in renown and how much respect they're given. So it's important to me as a woman, as a proud feminist to support other women and also non-binary and gender queer, gender fluid people who are vastly underrepresented, unfortunately, by reading more of their books. So this year, I think I did okay. So I read 65.6% .6 books written by female authors, 28% books written by male authors, and then 6.4% were written by non-binary or gender queer authors. Now it's possible that I missed a couple people. I didn't do a deep dive into people's personal lives to figure out this information. I literally just clicked on their name on Goodreads to go to their little bio and see if they had their pronouns listed, if they had any information. If there was nothing there, I went to their Twitter or their website and checked there and took what I could find. And I think this is pretty good. I am glad that the majority is female and non-binary and genderqueer. I would love to read more non-binary and genderqueer authors because obviously that's a pretty small chunk there. I am happy that I have some in there, but I would love to read more. So that's on me to continue to seek out those authors or read more work from the authors that I have found already who fit into that category so that I can make sure that I am learning about their stories and supporting them. So next we have the one that was what I was really thinking about at the start of the year when I said I wanted to diversify my reading, which was genre. So at the start of the year, I'm pretty certain I said in my first bookish video on this channel that I really wanted to make sure that I was reading a variety of genres and pushing myself to read books in genres that I'm not particularly drawn to because, well, for two reasons. Number one, because I took such a long break from reading anything other than nonfiction, I wanted to give myself the chance to kind of rediscover my tastes and see what it is that I actually enjoy and not just pick up things that are in genres that I know I enjoyed as a child or as a teenager, but to allow my adult self to figure out what I like. And the second part was to push myself to consume things that otherwise I wouldn't 
be exposed to and to try different things and to give them a chance. So that was my goal this year to try to read a bunch of different genres. And, and I think I did a pretty good job. I definitely read a lot more in genres that if I hadn't specifically had this challenge in mind, I probably would have read nothing from like horror, for example, and romance. But I think I probably could have done even better. So that's something I'm going to aim for in 2021. But anyway, let's go through the stats. So for genre, and again, I picked the primary genre for each book. So either the genre that was promoted as predominantly or what to me seemed like its main genre. So this is a bit subjective. And a lot of the books I read can fit into multiple genres. So keep that in mind. But the genre I read the most of this year was fantasy with 26 books. That is a bit surprising to me, I guess. I I mean, I know I like fantasy and I read fantasy as a child and a teenager and enjoyed it. I guess I'm surprised that it's my number one though, because I would have thought sci-fi would have been my number one. But sci-fi is a very close second with 23 books that were sci-fi. And I feel like I'm pretty open in sharing that sci-fi is my favorite genre to read. So again, I'm a bit surprised it wasn't my number one, but it was a close second. And I do feel like there are a few books that I read this year that I picked up thinking that they were sci-fi and after reading them I would categorize them more as fantasy and categorize them that way here in my stats. So that could be part of it as well. Next biggest group was nonfiction. I read 19 nonfiction books this year. Not surprising. I like nonfiction. As I said, nonfiction is basically all I read as an adult up until this year. So not surprising that I would continue to read nonfiction. My fourth most read genre was contemporary, which I guess is not that surprising because so many things can fall into the bucket of contemporary. It's basically all fiction that happens in a contemporary setting, which is a lot of fiction. So that makes sense. I read 11 contemporary books this year. My next most read genre would have absolutely shocked me of a year ago, and that is horror. I read 10 horror novels this year. I am the biggest scare cat in the whole entire universe. And that's not hyperbole. I'm sure there's maybe one or two people in the world who are bigger scaredy cats than me, but the number is small. I am so scared of everything. I have a vivid imagination and anxiety, bad combo. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure they go hand in hand. I, I, anyway, but <laughs> I will make things scarier and imagine them scarier and imagine them in vivid detail and scare myself and then go to bed at night and then have nightmares about them, etc. It's a cycle. It's awful. So I would have been shocked if me of now came to me a year ago and said, hey, you're going to read 10 horror novels this year and you're going to like it because I would never have thought. And that's one of those genres that I decided to try <laughs> this year because I wanted to push myself. And I'm so glad I did because while there were some horrors I read, that were a bit much for me, that did scare me, or the gore was too much for me. I would say the vast majority, if not all of the horrors I read, I at least enjoyed on some level, and some of them were some of my favorite books of the year. So take that past me. You can be a scaredy cat and also read horror. Don't you know? <laughs> my next most read genre is actually a tie between historical fiction and thriller. So thriller is kind of in the same boat as horror. I'm a bit surprised that I read so much thriller and enjoyed it so much. It's another genre that I have typically stayed away from because of my scaredy cat tendencies. And I read quite a few subpar thrillers this year, but I did read some fantastic thrillers as well. So that was kind of a fun experiment. And I feel like I'm starting to learn more and more what I actually like in thrillers and authors I like and kind of what to look for to find a thriller that I'll actually enjoy. And then historical fiction is not particularly shocking to me. I've always enjoyed historical fiction. I read quite a bit of historical fiction as a teenager. Like for example, Pope Joan, I read as a teenager for the first time. So that's not particularly shocking to me. Oh wait, it was a three-way tie. Just kidding. It's a three-way tie with mystery as well, which is also not particularly shocking. I always liked mystery. I feel like I got the kicks that I couldn't get from horror and thriller because I was too scared from mystery. And I've always liked the brain puzzle side of a mystery of trying to figure it out. So I'm not super surprised by that, but I think the number is also a little lower because I did try out horror and thriller so much more. And that kind of carved into the space that was usually just mystery for me. So next up, most read genre was classics. I read seven classics this year. Again, not particularly surprising to me. I do love classics. There are a bajillion more classics that I have not read yet that I would like to read. So I'm sure I will continue to read classics moving forward. My next most read genre was romance. So I read four romance 
novels this year. Romance is another one of those genres that I just have never really been drawn to. I've never been one to read, you know, a romance beach read sort of thing. It's just not, it's just never been my thing, which is interesting because I am a super emotional, super sentimental person and I love love and I am very affectionate and, you know, you know, deeply in love with my husband and I love showing him affection in a million ways and talking about why we love each other and doing all those silly romantic things. But for whatever reason, I just don't really like reading about it. I don't know why. It's interesting. I did read a couple romances that I really enjoyed this year. My favorite was Boyfriend Material. I thought that book was great. I also read a couple that were not my thing and also two of my DNFs. So half of my DNFs this year were romances. So I'm still kind of struggling here for how to find a romance that I like. I feel like maybe it's just that I don't like books that only focus on romance. I don't mind reading a book that has a romance subplot, but when it's the main thing, I guess I don't enjoy it. Or maybe it's just the tropes that are popular in romance irk me. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I guess I should probably try to read more romance in 2021 and diversify the types of romance I'm reading and see if I can find some kind of subgenre within romance that does it for me. I don't know. And then my least read genre of the year was poetry. I read two books that I would consider poetry. I do have plans to read more poetry in the new year. I actually made an Instagram post about this, how I'd read some poetry and I'd enjoyed it so much that I wanted to read more. I think poetry scares me for whatever reason. And it's interesting because I love language and I love plays. I love theater. I love a good sonnet, <laughs> but poetry for whatever reason feels unapproachable. <laughs> as a genre. If you have poetry to recommend to me that is approachable, let me know in the comments. If you have romances that you think I would like based on my general taste in books that you've seen in my videos, let me know. Well, really, if you have any books to recommend, let me know. But I feel like those are the two that I tried to dip my toe in, but kind of struggled with this year. So that's genre. That's my breakdown this year. If there's a genre I mixed all together, please let me know down below. I feel like I got all the main ones. I'm sure there's a genre I'm forgetting. So the next thing I wanted to look at was the LGBTQIA plus representation in a book. So characters that are within the LGBTQIA plus community. So this year I would say I did okay, but I can do better. So 36% of the books I read this year had LGBTQIA plus rep and 64% did not. So on the one hand, I'm happy that a third of the books I read this year had that rep because it's very important to me. On the other hand, I don't love that two thirds had literally zero representation, not even one character. And part of that is an issue with publishing and with what books are being published and authors not writing diverse characters. But part of that is also on me and I need to make sure that I continue to pick up books that have LGBTQIA plus rep, especially front and center rep, especially own voices rep. It's something that I've been trying to do this year, but I think I can keep pushing it. So I think I did a good job, but I think I can do better. So the next thing I looked at was my ratings for the year. And honestly, I was a bit surprised by this. The rating I gave the most this year was five stars, which honestly kind of shocks me. Now, on the one hand, it doesn't because I am reading for enjoyment and I love to love things. I love to be excited about things. I like to try to see the positive in things. So I guess I'm not surprised that there would be a lot of times that I really enjoyed a book and I got excited about it and I gave it five stars. And I think also I probably deserve some credit for knowing myself and finding awesome booktubers to watch and reading reviews and really thinking about the books that I'm choosing and not just randomly picking a book off the shelf without considering if I'm going to enjoy it. So I guess that's twofold. But honestly, I'm really surprised that I gave out so many five stars, then four stars, then three stars, then two stars, then one star. I actually only gave three one star ratings in this entire year. One star I really try to reserve for books that I actually hate or have strong negative feelings towards if hate is too strong of a word. I would say there's only one book this year that I read that I actually hated. Yeah, I'm, I'm very reticent to give out a one star. I'm much more likely to give out two stars if a book really disappoints me or is just not for me at all, which I gave 10 two star ratings this year. 
And then three stars is much more common if a book just doesn't work for me, because one thing I struggle with when it comes to rating is while obviously you're supposed to rate a book based on your own personal enjoyment or, you know, subjective thoughts on the merit of the work that you read, there's also an aspect of it that I like to keep in mind, which is what was the intended audience, especially if I am not that intended audience. So especially with YA, if I read YA and it really doesn't work for me, I try to look at it through the lens of, okay, how would I feel about this if I was still a teenager and try to temper my thoughts because I think it's easy as an adult to read a YA and be like, this was so juvenile one star, but it's meant to be juvenile because it's for teenagers, you know? So I, tr I try to do that as well. So I think that's kind of part of it too, is that I try to take all those factors into consideration when I'm rating something. Next is format. So the format I read these books in, whether it was audiobook, physical book, or ebook. This is pretty skewed this year because Corona got us down. As I mentioned already, I much prefer reading physical books. That is the best experience for me, hands down. And the coronavirus has made it difficult for that dream to come true because I cannot go to my library and take up physical books. And I'm not interested in buying a bunch of books for I know if I'm going to like them and want to keep them forever, keeping with my general values of trying to reduce consumerism and support eco-friendly practices and just be more conscious about my consumption. So I didn't want to buy all of these books in physical copy, not only because I couldn't afford to do that and because I don't have space for that, but also just because it's wasteful and I didn't want to do that. So my options this year were pretty much ebook or audiobook 99% of the time. And I despise ebooks with a burning passion. They hurt my eyeballs. I spend my whole day every day either in front of bright filming lights or staring at a screen editing. <laughs> and my eyeballs are extremely sensitive for some reason. So when I'm not working, the last thing I want to do is to be reading on my phone. It's just such an uncomfortable experience. So for that reason, because I hate ebooks with a burning passion and I could not go to my library and get physical books, I listened to the vast majority of audiobooks this year. And you know, I'm not mad at it. I really like audiobooks. I enjoy them. My parents got me started on audiobooks very young. Like honestly, before I have fully formed memories, my parents had me listening to audiobooks on tape my little tape player because I had insomnia as a child and uh, it was the only thing that would put me to sleep was listening to audiobooks of things like The Hobbit and Anne of Green Gables. So I've always loved audiobooks. I learned to consume them early on and it's been something that I've always enjoyed. And that kind of also translates to my love of podcasts and listening to YouTube videos. So I know some people dislike audiobooks because they have trouble following along or they just they get lost or they can't concentrate. That's not a problem for me. I feel like I do great with audiobooks. I will say that I do increase the speed because if I leave them at one time speed, my mind will wander. But if I put them up to 1.8, two times speed, sometimes more than that, depending on the narrator, I can focus no problem. So love audiobooks. So I read 83.2% audiobooks this year, 8.8% of the books I read were physical books and 8% were audiobooks. The next thing I decided to look at was the nationality of the author. So this was a bit hard to find and a lot of people had multiple nationalities. I tried to write down where the author was born or where they lived in childhood. I'm pretty disappointed in this, to be honest. I need to read more from authors who are from all around the world instead of basically only reading American voices. And part of this is on me and where I'm getting my recommendations. I follow a lot of American booktubers who are being sent books by American publishers written by American authors authors and I need to do a better job of seeking out recommendations from people who live in other areas and read in other languages. Yes, most of the books I read this year were by American authors. Next was British authors, though that is way smaller in comparison. Next is Canadian authors, but tiny in comparison, which is very sad because I'm Canadian. I need to do better. I purposefully tried to pick up some Canadian work this year, but I just need to make it more of a priority. And then next was Nigeria, then Australia, then France, then China, Haiti, Israel, Jamaica, South Korea, and Sweden. And that's it. Okay, next I looked at language. And again, this is 
pretty uh, dismal. So languages of the books I read, 96.8% were originally published in English and I read them in English. 1.6% were originally published in French and I read them in French. And then 1.6% were translated from their original language into English. That is abysmal. I need to definitely do better about reading more translated work. Unfortunately, the only other language I can read in other than English is French because those are the only two languages I speak, but I would love to read more French work. I do have plans to read more in French in the new year and I need to seek out more translated work because it's important to get perspectives from all around the world and from different people. It's really easy to continue to read books written by North American English speaking authors and kind of stay in my own bubble. And that's not what I want to do because reading really should be a way to open your mind and your heart to a vast array of experiences. And I can't do that if I'm only reading work that's been published basically in the US in English by authors who are American and speak English. That's not true diversity in my reading, you know? So something I really need to work on. Again, if you have recommendations, let me know. The next thing I looked at was the year published. I thought this might be interesting. So I read a couple books that are going to be published in 2021 in the form of ARCs. But as you can see, the vast majority of the books I read this year were 2020 releases, which is not surprising because I was excited about new books coming out that were being hyped up by my favorite booktubers. Same thing with 2019, 2018 were my runners up. And again, those are just kind of recently hyped up books that I was late to getting to because I wasn't reading avidly when they came out. Um, and then it kind of goes down from there, you know, 2017, 2016, 2015, and 2014 were pretty heavily represented. Once you get earlier than 2013, things start to trickle out a little bit, though I did read some older books. So I read a book published in 1979. I read a book published in 1959, 1942, one from 1939, one from 1929, one from 1925. And then my three oldest were 1895, 1886, and 1868. Definitely skewed towards new releases, but I feel like I did an okay job about reading some older books as well. And then the very last thing I looked at was the racial diversity of the authors I was reading from. So this is really important. This has been a big conversation in the bookish community this year, the importance of reading from racially diverse authors, the importance of reading from people who don't look like you and who have different lived experiences from you. Some of this is due to the publishing landscape and how many more white authors are published than people of color. But I definitely tried to be conscious about picking books written by authors who were black or indigenous or another person of color. That was important to me and I tried to do it. I think my stats are okay. I look at them and I think it's not awful, but again, I think I could do better. So that's something I'm really focusing on for 2021. So my numbers were 68.8% books written by white authors and 31.2% written by authors who are black, indigenous, or person of color. So again, it's around the 30% mark, which I don't think is atrocious, but it's not as good as it could be. And I acknowledge that. So I really want to do better about this and really focus on it. Ideally, I would love it to at least be 50-50. I think that that's not too much to ask. <laughs> And honestly, it should be more because the fact that one racial group is allowed to take up 50% while every other racial group gets to share the other 50% is honestly just kind of fucked up. So I don't, I don't want that to be my ratio. I made a conscious effort and I am proud of the effort I made. And I think a third of my reads being written by BIPOC authors is a good first step, but it is just that a first step. So I'm going to keep doing better. And part of how I do that is by following a diverse group of booktubers who are black and indigenous and other people of color who are recommending books that they love from people within their racial group that they can speak to, who are doing own voices reviews of books written by people of color. So I highly recommend that for you as well. If you do a quick tally and realize that your authors are looking really white, I would recommend checking out booktubers who are from a wide array of backgrounds who can give you those own voices recommendations that I think are really valuable. So with that, that is the end of my stats. Those are all the stats that I collected. That's all the data. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the variety in graphs. 
I certainly enjoy looking at them. Again, if you have recommendations to help me reach any of the goals I mentioned in this video, please leave them down below. I have a master list. I will add them to it. Also, of course, today's giveaway, if you want to enter it, leave me a comment letting me know what data point I should track in 2021 that I did not already track for 2020. I want to know. Give it to me. And if you want to know what you're even entering to win, hang on, pending. It's midnight now. I'm tired. It's been a long day. Oh, I love plant mist, don't get me wrong, but it takes a lot out of me. It's a lot of work. Okay, a notebook therapy notebook. This gorgeous beige constellation notebook. Very pretty. I love it. You can choose what size you would like. This is the B5 size, which obviously is my fave, but they also have their original size, which is a little bit smaller than an A5 or A5 size. And then you also get the adorable pop-up pencil case. This one is the deep blue, which I think is a really nice color. They have corduroy at the bottom and then they pop up as the name implies to hold all your supplies. And then when you unzip it and pop it down, it can sit on a table and hold all your things and look adorable. I have a yellow one that I use literally every single day. I love it. So, so if you win, you will be winning the size of your choice of this beautiful beige constellation notebook from notebook therapy and the deep blue pop-up pencil case from their winter collection. Very exciting prize. So check out the description box for the official rules, regulations, make sure you follow them so that if I pick your name, you are not disqualified for not following the rules. That would suck. And with that, I'm going to go because it is after midnight and I am so, so tired and I still have to edit this video before I go to bed. <laughs> the realities of plant mist for you all. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your support through plant mist. It means so much to me. I am so glad to see all of you being excited about what I'm making. Also, thank you for 90,000 subscribers. My mind is absolutely blown. I don't even know how to conceptualize that many people. Last year around this time, I was approaching 50,000 subscribers. So the fact that I have almost doubled in a year, it's honestly mind blowing. So thank you so much. If you have joined the family during plant mist, welcome. We are so happy to have you. And I'm really excited to have you around for 2021. So much exciting content to come. And I'm going to get going before I start rambling. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I will see you very soon tomorrow for our last day of plant mist, plant mist day 12. Bye friends. Before I go, I want to thank my patrons for their support. These are all of their names. They are lovely. They are amazing. Thank you so much for your support. If you at home want to join the squad, feel free. There's a link in the card and in the description box down below. And we would love to have you. Okay, bye.